ladies and gentlemen, Nancy Moran and Fett. I guess we're ready, huh? <laughs> hey, everybody. Stop. That's Nancy Moran over there, <laughs> my partner in crime. Uh, we're here to teach you a class today about creating compelling arrangements. Instead of just having everything kind of vanilla in your music, you can do an awful lot uh, just by varying up a couple of things, uh, adding one instrument or doing one thing additionally with a second voice. And we're going to illustrate a whole bunch of that stuff based on some techniques that the two of us developed, have developed uh, over 30 plus years of performing together, something like that. Yeah, and just because if, if you're playing by yourself, you can do this by yourself too. You can you can do it within a song. You can do it for film and TV by adding extra parts and uh, and doing that. Or if you want to do it by yourself when you're performing, uh, you can just switch strums or whatever. You you can do some of these things totally by yourself. So it's important. What Nancy's getting at here is it's important to vary things up, uh, even if you're the only performer. Uh, the only person playing or singing the song, you can change what you do from verse to verse or radically change things from chorus to verse and vice versa yeah. to really uh, maintain the listener's interest and really make your songs compelling. So we're going to go over that as kind of a general uh, framework of what we're doing here. And then we're going to show you a lot of specific techniques. Uh, I might pipe in here or there with uh, some PowerPoint or something after the fact, but this is the live portion. Uh, where you get to have the two of us <laughs> oh boy. sit here and uh, hope we don't have a train wreck. <laughs> hey gang, it's Fett piping in here. I just want to run through a couple of real quick PowerPoint slides here to kind of give you a little bit of context before we get into the first song. So first of all, uh, a lot of you folks might know us. Uh, we've been around the Taxi Road Rally for 18 years in a row now. But in case you don't, uh, Nancy is a singer-songwriter and a touring artist who toured with the Four Bitchin' Babes for quite a few years. And she's an artist development coach. And I'm a producer engineer, author, and uh, more importantly for this particular presentation, Nancy's sidekick. We've been performing together for and recording for about 30 years now. So uh, we uh, got a lot of arranging experience between the two of us uh, working together. So why do we write record and perform our music well to be honest with you the main reason is to create an emotional impact and connect that emotional impact with our audience now how do we do that well we want to make the music interesting and memorable to listen to not only do we want to get the user's attention but we want to maintain the user's attention while we're going through the course of a song and reinforce that emotional content and quite frankly, one of the nice side effects of that is it kind of makes it more interesting for us to perform the songs. And the way we do that is through these compelling arrangements that we're going to be talking about. Now, compelling arrangements can be done during the writing stage and the performing stage, not just the recording stage. So this is something to uh, a framework, if you will, uh, a point of view to think about whenever you're working with your music. And you can do this for your own commercial artist releases. You can do this for stuff you're writing for film and TV. And you can also do it for demos that you're pitching to publishers for other people to, uh, to record. All of these will result in uh, getting that emotional connection with the audience, whether it's a fan or somebody in the industry. And we're, even though we're going to be using guitars today in this presentation, this can apply to any instrument, any combination of instrument, and the same thing for vocals. The concepts here are about doing things with uh, various parts of the arrangement can be used for vocal parts just as much as they can be used for instrumentals. So don't get hung up on the fact that we're just happen to be two guitars and we're talking about a lot of guitar stuff here. It applies across the board regardless of what instrumentation you're using and also to vocals. And not only can you use this for your own music, but you can do it for cover songs as well. So here's very briefly some of what we're going to go over here. We're going to talk about doubling or layering parts. We're going to talk a lot about chord voicings and phrasing. We're going to have a couple of examples of surprise chords, a drone, uh, some signature lines and riffs that run through the song or the arrangement, and some counter chords or contrast chords. That's kind of the, the overall uh, area that we're going to cover in terms of chordal and melodic stuff. But we're also going to talk a little bit on the rhythmic side of things with strumming and picking variation, variations, and particularly 
uh, about using changes in dynamics. And we're going to touch a little bit on the vocal side of things, uh, maybe talk about some counter melodies and that stuff, but we don't have a lot of time to go too deeply into it. So that's what we're going to get into. And if you like what you see in this class, we've set up a, uh, a nice little thing that has a whole bunch of goodies for you after the fact. Just go to azaleamusic.com slash taxi2021. We've got a whole bunch of links up there and all sorts of other stuff, including a longer version of this PowerPoint presentation and some other stuff. So that's our story. Let's get to it. We're going to get to the first song here. Um, and this is a song where we both actually play the same chords, generally speaking, uh, on the same fret on, on two guitars. And even the guitars are fairly similar. Nance has a, a, yeah. a spruce top. Uh, I have a cedar top on mine. So their tone's a little bit different. But generally the same type of guitar, uh, the same chord uh, structure, and also the same fret. But even within that, we're going to create some variation to... to uh, have a compelling arrangement. Yeah, so we should show them first what it would sound like if we both played the same thing. Yeah. And we're, we're just very vanilla. Right. Uh, very boring. So uh, all the songs you're going to hear today are uh, originals, mostly written by Nancy. I, I chimed in on a couple. Uh, our friend Tom Prasada Rao chimed in on a couple. Uh, but uh, these are all original songs, but the concepts that we're uh, providing here you can apply to covers as well. In Absolutely. fact, if you want to get a unique, interesting, compelling cover, yeah. uh, one of the best things you can do is come up with a different arrangement of it than the one everyone's used to. Uh, so this is what the song would sound like if uh, we both played exactly the same thing all the way through. I don't, I don't know if I can play <laughs> Yeah, really. <laughs> okay, me let me see. That's, that's really weird. <laughs> yeah. So you'll see that the song's going to end up very different from that. But that's the, the vanilla approach where you've got a lyric, you've got chords, you've got a melody, and you kind of perform them without a whole lot of arrangement, dynamics, and, and a whole bunch of other stuff we're going to show you. Yeah. So uh, in this song, we're not going to play every song all the way through. We're going to play mm -hmm. parts of songs so you can kind of hear each point illustrated and we don't take all day. Um so this one's called Honestly, and again, we both play the same fret, the same general chord structure, and what have you. But the reason we do that in this song is that we want to reinforce the power uh, of the groove of the song. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes doubling things uh, is actually just as compelling and interesting, if you do it right, as making things very, very different from one another. Uh, so... Um, while Nancy plays this, this is her, uh, her basic riff uh, groove of the song. So while she plays that, I'm doing something a little different here. the main part of the verse and uh, I'm playing a little bit of a pseudo bass line uh, even though I'm playing the same chords as her and a slightly different rhythm uh, that's a little bit counter to what she's doing so she's holding down that that pocket that groove all the way through while I'm kind of working against it then when we hit uh, the next section uh, Nancy plays uh, fairly straight chords but still within that groove and I play uh, arpeggios uh, up and down the neck in different positions than she's in um, with open kind of dissonant chords. So uh, you can lead into that next section. Here's that section again. what's going on uh, under the song. So we're going to go ahead and play 
like a, a whole round of a verse so you can kind of hear how the whole thing holds together now with all those different parts. Take it away, Nanner. That's probably a lot more compelling than <laughs> what we were doing before, right? I'm trying to tell you. I can't even sing it that yeah, way. Yeah, really. <laughs> I can't even think it. I can't even think it in that language. Yeah. By the way, the reason I keep looking down here is I have a cheat sheet uh, in front of me because there's no way I could remember <laughs> all this stuff. Uh, so the, anyway, that's a song that uses uh, essentially the same parts um, yeah. but varied uh, within that same part. Uh, to uh, enforce and, and uh, to reinforce, rather, the, the pocket and the groove. Okay, so now we're going to move on, and we're going to uh, have a little variation now in terms of where each of us plays on the guitar. So Nancy is on the second fret. She's playing in A position, uh, as guitar chords go. And I'm on the fourth fret, and I'm playing in G position. So now what you get is you start stretching out the chord. So when Nance plays an A chord... And I play a G chord, and you combine them. How about we hold one out together? One, two, three. You're getting a lot fuller chord yeah. now because you're able to play notes at the bottom and the top of the chord because of where you're uh, positioned on the neck that make it more than just six maximum notes on the guitar. Uh, this applies to any instrument, but uh, especially when you're using a capo on a guitar. So the first thing we're doing then is varying where we play and, and therefore what chords we play. I'm playing in G, she's playing in A. But the other thing we're doing is we're actually playing different patterns uh, with our uh, uh, different guitar parts. Uh, so while Nancy plays the main groove, uh, I'm playing a lot of what we call diamonds in Nashville because they look like a di diamond shape on a Nashville number chart, but they're holds. And they're typically for a whole uh, chord, a whole bar rather, or half a bar. Um, but I'm holding out chords while she's playing through them. Uh, and then I'm also going to play uh, a little bit of a, of a riff um, that's going to actually be a recurring theme in the song uh, for you to listen to as well. And then we have a couple of variations on some of the chord patterns, which we might talk about a little bit later after we've gone through it a little bit. So this is Perfect World uh, in G and A, uh, but actually in the key of B because of where we're uh, <laughs> positioned on the neck with the different strum patterns. All right.
So uh, what I was supposed to play with that signature riff was... <laughs> So I'm doing a lot of hammer-ons, pull-offs, uh, a riff that I messed up twice, not just once, uh, and also a lot of arpeggios. So I'll do uh, something like this while Nance is strumming through it. And that helps not only uh, to create a contrast in the arrangement between the different instrumental parts, but also leave some room for the vocal to breathe. Uh, in this particular song, uh, it's not quite about the uh, the uh, you know uh, controlled anger, if you will, of the last song. It's a lot more uh, intimate and personal a song, and you want to leave room for the vocal to be heard and not be banging through it with two guitars kind of powering through. Uh, so that makes a big, big difference when one of the guitars, uh, one of the parts, whatever it happens to be, can back off. Uh, play more open, uh, play individual notes and arpeggios, hold notes uh, and chords and things like that, rather than uh, duplicating the strum, it, for lack of a better way to put it. It also gives you um, the ability to make dynamics in the song. Like if you back off and I'm still going, the song drops out somewhat, you know, so it gives you a little more dynamic range for that matter right and and that's a, a big thing that you you see a lot uh, in all music starting with classical music you've got this whole notion uh, of a breakdown and then a crescendo right. and you've got these two uh, push and pull kind of ebb and flow sort of things everything you do like that yeah. is gonna either maintain the listener's attention and keep them in the emotion of the song or recapture the listener's attention uh, and get the into the emotion of the song. So if you've been going through a song and you're two or three verses and choruses into it and you're not done yet, uh, you're going to want to have ways of keeping them present with you yeah. uh, in the same way that you felt when you wrote the song, uh, when you first came up with the idea, the, the lyric, the music, and everything else. So that's song number two. Okay. All right, our next song. Uh, by the way, uh, we're going to give a lot of examples here of the two of us being... Uh, uh, two frets apart. Uh, one of us is in G uh, fingering, one is in A fingering. We might move where they are in the neck, but this just using G and A uh, as your basis for jumping off for compelling arrangements. You don't have to know seven different ways to, to be on different capo positions and four frets apart or six frets apart or two or whatever. You can take one technique, which we're yeah. going to show multiple times here, uh, and just use that and then do the things like varying the strums and using the dynamics and holding out chords and, and things like and that. And this is a great example for uh, those of you who feel that you're not very skilled at guitar, maybe your a capo is your best friend because you can you can change the capo position and then change the key of the song but still play in a, a pattern that's familiar to you. If you're feeling like you uh, don't know how to play guitar very well, capo is your best friend. Uh, I, I play a lot uh, using a capo. I play a lot in G, I play a lot in A, I play, uh, that's, that's it. I play a lot in E maybe, but I don't, I don't play very many chords, so <laughs> um, yeah. Well, not only uh, is a capo your friend uh, if you're used to playing in certain keys, but uh, Nancy also varies things up by using alternate tunings. Oh, yeah. Uh, and you don't need to have a whole lot of fingerings in o alternate tunings. Uh, you still get an interesting sound just by doing that. Yeah, we're not going to do a lot of alternate tuning in this just because we didn't want to tune the guitar. And, and, and you know. make the, the class nine hours yeah, long. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, there's a whole lot more th uh, than this uh, from where this came from, but, yeah. but we're going to stick to a few uh, basic concepts. Okay. Um, another thing related to what Nancy said about the capo, uh, when, when she's playing in, uh, in A position and I'm playing in G position or vice versa, um, it really, really helps if you're the person playing the second part or you're playing a second part to yourself when you're recording uh, or you know writing a song uh, to put down for, say, film and TV or something like that and layering the parts to think in terms of numbers and not in terms of absolute chords. 
Uh, we live and die and breathe every day by the Nashville uh, number system here in Nashville. And it really helps to free you up from having to figure the song out again when you come up with that next part. Uh, so I think of everything in terms of ones, fives, fours, six minors, two minors, uh, three minors, that kind of thing. I'm not thinking, oh, Nance is in E flat and I am positioned three positions on the neck below or above her. So when she plays an E flat chord, I have to play a so-and-so. She's playing in one. I'm playing in one. And once you get just the relationships of the chords in the song, then that's all you have to remember. And you don't have to constantly transpose in your head. And it saves astronomical amounts of time. And that's partly how we've managed to develop this uh, system, if you will, over the years, is because we don't have to constantly transpose and, and figure out uh, keys and chords and all that kind of stuff. It's like a, we're always playing in one or six minor if it's a minor song. But that's a whole that's a whole nother class. All righty. Yeah, I, I, I don't think in numbers. I think in chords because uh, I just do. And that's good because because <laughs> you usually write the song, right? Yeah, I do. And you come up with your part. Right. So for you, it's in right. the key that it's in and you're playing the chords that you're playing. But for for having to do that second part, again, yeah. whether it's you or somebody else, they need to think at least uh, right. in the number system uh, in order to save themselves a lot of time. Moving right along, our next song uh, is also uh, using this same uh, fingering. Uh, Nancy's playing in A position, but she's open. Uh, and I'm in on fret number two and playing in G position. So same technique, same relationships uh, between our... Uh, uh, yeah. I, I should probably tell her what yeah. song is next on the list. I'm the one with the cheat sheet here. Uh, this one's called Saved, and it's a very, very different type of song uh, in that it's it's not up, and it doesn't have a pocket and a groove in the same way that those other two songs we just did do. Uh, so the important thing in this song, uh, and all of the stuff is based on what the song calls for. Uh, you've always got to think from that perspective. But this one needs each of us to stay out of each other's way and play sparsely. Yeah, in fact, this one didn't feel like... That's what I'm playing most of the time. And it didn't feel finished, you know, but with Fett's part, it is finished. And that's a key thing when you're, when you're coming up with parts, and especially if you know you're going to have multiple parts in an arrangement that work off of each other, you don't have to fill all the holes with one part. So Nance is actually leaving a lot of space with that little tap uh, finger picking thing she's doing for something else uh, to complement it. Um, so that's what we ended up doing with this song. Uh, so Nance plays that, that finger tapping thing. And also within the chord, she's doing that little sus thing on the A. Right there. Okay, so that's like the motif of her part through the song. Now what I play is a pumping strum, which is totally different. So I'm doing this. What? Well, the help of it's in tune too. I'll, I'll uh, bring that string down a little bit. So I'm just doing this. So I'm playing more of a straight eighths kind of pump thing, which actually complements what she's doing really well. So go ahead and play your part. Now the two parts work together, even though they're totally different, and there's not a lot going on. So that's what, uh, that's kind of the basic underlying structure of the song in terms of the arrangement. Now, the other thing that's going on here uh, is I've got a signature riff that I play through the song that is also one of the melodic hooks in the song. And in order to, to switch back and forth between uh, a finger picking with my, with my fingers and playing with my pick on that straight eighths pump, I need to play chicken picking style, which is a Nashville thing where you play with a pick and you use the other fingers to do finger picking parts. So my uh, signature riff, if you will, that goes through is a chicken picking part and it goes like this. And when I'm 
done with that, then I go to the and I'm just using the pick. Uh, so when you put all the stuff together, it sounds like this. All right, here we go. One, two, three, four. I don't want you to understand me. I don't want you to try and figure out. All my problems don't have solutions. Sometimes trouble is what it's That was the shortest song we've ever played. <laughs> so there's some other stuff going on here. Uh, in addition to that signature riff, uh, Nancy's tap uh, strumming thing while I'm doing the straight eighths pumping strum, um, I play a lot of arpeggios in this song. She keeps that basic pattern going all the time, but when we go into the next part of the verse, I'm doing a lot of this. And that helps, uh, again, leave a little bit of room for the vocal and not have uh, as much you know, activity going on in the underlying um, instrumentation. The other thing is, when we get to the end uh, of a verse, uh, Nance plays a little thing where she does a five sus to a seven. Uh, to a five to a five sus to a five uh, seven or dominant seventh. See, I'm talking in five here, not an E, because <laughs> I'm not playing an E, I'm playing a D. So once again, and what, while she's doing that, I'm actually climbing up the neck through a sequence of chords. So I do this. So I'm actually playing different chords than she is, but they're complementary chords. Mm -hmm. So let's do that together. One, two, three, four. And you get a really full openness from two guitars by not really playing, no one's playing any complicated chords here, but when you combine <laughs> them together, that's when you get those nice big spread chords that we were talking about before. Actually, while we're on that, uh, there is one other thing that we do. Uh, after that little climb up, um, we both do a little retard and a hold. Mm -hmm. And that's one of those dynamic things where you want to provide some drama. We could have gone... But it just yeah. doesn't have that same uh, drop and that, again, grabbing the listener's attention and pulling them back in. Uh, so when you Especially play... Especially because that's the hook line. Right. I don't want to be saved. So, so that's a good point about it being a hook line. You leave all that room for those vocal pickup notes to go into that mm -hmm. final line, uh, which is the hook of the song. Uh, so that's another technique you can do is just play a big open chord, everybody stop together, whatever number of instruments you've got going on, that big diamond as we call it in Nashville, uh, in order to allow the vocal to come through and, and sort of deliver the punchline. And um, I wanted to mention one other thing. This is a great way to vary a set if you're, if you're performing live. Uh, one one technique is to throw in, you know, if you do lots of up-tempo, really rowdy songs, that's great. But every now and then, you want to bring it down. Here, here. Because the audience, audience needs a little break every now and then. So this is a great song to just take it down a notch. And honestly, I find that um, I find that sometimes this is the song that gets most of the attention or songs like it even though the rowdy songs might be the ones that people remember or or sing along to and all that stuff they like the break so it's here, just here. just another way to vary things up yeah and following up on that point um not only do they need a break within the set where you're ebbing and flowing the mood and what have you but you can put those breaks within a song yeah, we're going to have some more true. illustrations further on here 
where you're barreling along on a song and you've got the groove going and it's up tempo and everything else and all of a sudden something else comes out of nowhere uh, and really helps to to, uh, to keep the song uh, at the forefront of the listener's mind and give them a little break in the middle of it at the same time. Well, moving right along now, uh, we're going to do uh, another song that's got, believe it or not, Nancy playing in A position and me playing in G position, oh, yeah. except that she's on the fifth fret and I'm on the seventh. So we've really been varying uh, things around here. Uh, and Fett's going to sing this one. Hey, look out. <laughs> So this is one of those songs where we do a lot of different chord voicings. And uh, a lot of the uh, crossing of chord voicings is built around the add nine uh, or add two and the sus four chord. So uh, your typical thing where you're, uh, where you're doing uh, an add two or an add nine is when you, on guitar anyway, you typically drop a string. Uh, same thing here. That's an add two or an add nine, because when you drop the string, you're actually adding that note, uh, the two or the nine, depending on what position you are. Uh, and the other one is the sus, of course, which is like this. There's the sus, or this one here. So what you can play in terms of susses and add two, add nines, depends on where you are in the neck. Uh, of the guitar, like a G uh, sus is a totally different uh, type of chord position for your fingers and may or may not sound as good uh, as a G sus uh, as it does as an A sus down two frets. Mm -hmm. So those are some things to work with, but the, the important thing is uh, to use those uh, add two, add nines and sus four chords a lot against other variations of the chords, even if it's just the straight triad, major triad. And that will really fill out and open up your chords considerably. Uh, so this song does a lot of that stuff. In fact, uh, the main thing that my part is doing in this is actually both an add two or add nine and a sus at the same time. So when I land on this one chord, I'm doing this. So I'm actually playing both. Nancy never does that. She does other stuff with susses and uh, yep. add nines and, and what have you, and some, some straight uh, triads. Um, let's see. Uh, let's go through that a little bit to uh, kind of see how the, uh, how the whole thing fits together now. Uh, different capo positions, different chords, therefore, and this whole messing around with uh, opening up the chords with uh, susses and add to add nines. Okay, so we're going to start the song. So let's go from the beginning. One, two, three, four. basic thing that's going on between the two guitars and you can hear especially with my uh, uh, capo being so far up that we're getting a little bit of that nice changy almost mandolin-y sound well Nancy's capo is down far enough to still get some good bottom on her chords yeah. another couple things I want to mention quick uh, the first one is I'm doing that climb sequence that I had uh, in a previous song while Nance is doing something different, uh, we're working against each other there. Uh, and there's a lot of movement with the chords. We're, we're, we're both moving around and stuff. So when we get to the chorus, um, we actually do some more of that stuff, even though the melody and the, the prosody uh, and the, uh, the meter of the, the lyrics and the melody change. Uh, Should we do the chorus? Yeah, let's, let's run down a chorus here. Okay. Uh,
lot of the same techniques that we were doing in the verse, but we varied them up a little bit uh, underneath what's going on uh, with the, the harmony vocals and what have you. So the song's kind of tooling along for a while, but now we need something uh, new again uh, to grab the listener's attention. So the bridge is a total departure. Uh, and different. this is, there's two uh, important things we do in the bridge. The first is we use a lot of dynamics where we do hard stops. And we do that with every instrument uh, in, in the arrangement, uh, both guitars in this case. Uh, but we also have the introdu uh, introduction of our first surprise chord. So we've been playing <laughs> one, four, five, six yeah. minor type stuff, maybe a little variation with a sus or something like that, but we, uh, or seventh. Uh, dominant seven, something like that. But now we need something really, really uh, uh, attention getting. And this is a common thing we do in a bridge. We want the bridge to kind of go off into another place, take the song somewhere else so it can come back to sort of deliver the, the final chorus and what have you. So what we do here is we actually play a four diminished seventh in the bridge. Now, there's been no diminished chords or anything like that in the song so far. Uh, and we do the hard stops. Uh, so we're going to come out of uh, the end of a chorus and go right into the bridge. A little too late. Well, I'd take it back if I could. Hold my breath and knock on wood. Make my act up really good. If anyone could tell. Well, you've got her dimples on your face. And you've got scars I can't erase. So that surprise chord after the stops right here just totally takes the song in a different direction. And that's an arrangement thing. We could have uh, played a much, much simpler chord there. I think uh, probably, you know, for me anyway, an E minor probably would have worked there. Uh, but to play that four diminished seven chord uh, really, really kind of grabbed the, uh, the attention of the listener. Um, so, so the last thing, you're done with that? Yeah, go okay. for it. So the last thing is... We used to play this song all the time, and we really kind of, I don't know, we kind of burnt out on it because um, the song was really, the, the chorus particularly, was really long, and um, it just kind of got boring, and we didn't, we, we, know, we knew we needed something else to put into the song to make it worth doing, um, so the last time that we do the chorus, um, I sing a counter melody. And that, for this song, it just made the whole song, I think. It, it just livened it up. And it, it gave each part of the song something for the listener to, to grab onto. And not only that, uh, not only did it kind of keep uh, something new and fresh for the listener after hearing but the chorus us. three or four <laughs> times, but for us. Yeah. So not only do you want to make your arrangements compelling to listen to, but also to perform. Yeah. Because if you're interested and things are changing and flowing and ebbing and all that kind of stuff, you're going to give a better performance as well, which again, is, in turn, is going to bring the listener in more. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So... Um, We'll, we'll come out of uh, the last verse here and yeah. go into the chorus. Some people Want to finish it? Some people learn. <laughs> Some people dance.
So I realize there's a lot going on at the end, uh, at the the tag at the end of the song. You put in that little counter melody right at the very end. Um, we put in the surprise chord again yep. uh, there the that time. we had in the bridge. So there's a little uh, little linkage there and a little bit of surprise saying we're going somewhere now. So while we're on songs that Fett sings, uh, another thing you want to do if you're a duo uh, or if, again, you're a single player, but you uh, want to vary up your show and or your recordings is not to always play the same instrument every time. So what we're going to do in this one is Nancy, rather than playing a normal guitar part, is going to play a percussion part. Um, I grew up in the Middle East. Uh, a lot of my music has a lot of Middle Eastern influences. And so she's going to play basically like a djembe part uh, while I'm playing guitar on this. And so not only does it uh, open up the uh, the variety of the arrangements and, uh, and the ebb and flow of the songs and what have you, uh, but it also leaves one instrument now to be the focus uh, of the chords and, and the strums and what have you. Um, so uh, we'll just play a little verse and chorus of this one to kind of show you with the interaction uh, between uh, the two instruments now in the arrangement. And also, Nancy's going to bring in another counter melody here uh, in the choruses, uh, like we did in the, uh, the very last chorus of the other song. So I uh, probably should have mentioned that uh, Nancy is not playing on any capo, uh, and I am playing uh, on three uh, in straight, straight C. Hey, no G or A this time. I'm actually playing different fingering. All right, here we go. One, two. Well... So there's a lot going on there uh, with one guitar, basically, and a percussion instrument, and it really helps to uh, keep the song interesting and flowing along with that, uh, that counter melody that's in there. Uh, our co-writer, uh, Tom Prasada Rao, came up with that idea when the song was written. Got to give credit where it's due. Uh, and there's also one other little thing in this song. Uh, you'll notice I played lots and lots of uh, sus fours, add nines, all sorts of other things. I even have this wonky chord here. <laughs> going into the uh, the chorus. So again, the opening up those chords really helps. Um, but in the bridge, we have a little bit of a dynamic thing uh, that I just want to illustrate here uh, to give another idea of uh, breaking the song up a little bit. I'll take every part of your broke, broken heart, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, a couple things are happening there. One, we have that big retard and that hold at the end of the chorus, uh, end of the bridge, rather, to lead into the final verse of the song. So that's another one. Suck the listener in there. Uh, the other thing that's going on is this is a different chords altogether. Uh, we suddenly go to a minor key uh, in the in the bridge, and we also add a little descending bass line. So the chords are going. Sounds remarkably similar to 25 or 64 for all those old folks out there. So putting something like that in there, not only just changing up the chords, but putting in a bass line that you play. Again, it's just one guitar will really, really help the arrangement and keep it uh, interesting and compelling. <laughs> 
All right, so we've actually got a song where we're still doing the G and A thing, except this time Nancy is playing in G fingering and I'm playing in A fingering, just to be different. Uh, of course, we're now on uh, the first fret for me, uh, which means we're in the key of B flat this time. Again, this is a, another reason you want to think in terms of ones, fours, and fives and not B flat. Uh, you know, those flat and sharp keys <laughs> yeah. always uh, drive people nuts. So this is a, a good uh, example of both chord contrasts. We're both playing kind of normal chords, but with some variation between them. Uh, and also some dynamics. There's a fair amount of dynamics in this song. And I also play uh, a signature riff, which we've seen in, in a previous song. Uh, but this is a thing that recurs through every verse to kind of reinforce a little bit. It's like its own uh, little melodic hook. Um, so let's just play a little bit of this uh, to kind of give the idea and pay attention to the different uh, interaction of the guitars. So the, the little signature riff that I play is uh, very simple, or depending on where we are in the song, and again that gives us a nice spread of chords. Um, and the, the descending line that we do, that four chord descending sequence is a little bit different. We're already playing in different positions uh, and chord figures because of the where the capos are. But the third chord of the sequence, uh, let's see, uh, my little cheat sheet tells me uh, Nancy does a 4, 4 over 3, 2 minor 7 to a 5, 7, while I do a 4, 4 over 3, 5 add 9 uh, to a 5, 7. And it's that third chord that really, really opens up. So let's take them nice and slowly. First okay. chord. Second chord, third chord, then so when you hear the chords by themselves, you think, wow, there's a couple of rubs in there sometimes, and that's okay. If it's in passing and the stuff resonates well, it's okay to have a little bit of a rub every now and then. I mean, uh, there's a lot of people uh, vocally who made rubbing uh, a career out of rubbing, like the story, the, story, yeah. uh, the Indigo Girls, people like that have very, very close half note harmonies and stuff. And when they happen occasionally in chords or vocals or stuff, they can be really, really interesting. You got to play them very consistently and be super tight with your chops in order to pull them off. Uh, but when they happen right, they really uh, can sound very beautiful in a song. So that was unconditional love. And I think the other thing we want to mention about this is um, this is one of those songs where you can really add some dynamics by not playing at all. <laughs> this happens to be a song of Nancy's. It's very popular in the folk market. It's mm -hmm. got a very, uh, uh, you know, peace and love kind of folky message to it and what have you. And it's a great song, therefore, for people to sing along with. Uh, so what we do is we actually come out of one section of the song and go completely a cappella and then back into it. So let's just show them that real okay. quick. One, two, three, four. Unconditional love. I wish you joy. I, I wish you peace. I wish you more than you will ever need. I wish you unconditional that's not part of the song <laughs> couldn't help myself i just had to throw one of those in there somewhere so uh that's another form of dynamics is when you just cut the instruments out yeah. entirely again uh, as a performance and and a recording as well a lot of times that's really really effective
All right, this next song proves that, yes, we can actually play a song in a minor key, and we don't have to be in exactly the same relationship of our, uh, of our capos. In this case, Nancy is on the fifth fret, She's playing an E minor position, and I'm actually open and playing in, therefore, A minor position. But what you'll notice in this song is that what we play is very, very different. And part of the reason is this is a, uh, a ghostly song uh, with a very intimate lyric, and we don't want to get in the way with too much arrangement here. So it's very, very sparse, and yet it has this a consistent thing that, that, that goes through the song and never stops based around a finger picking pattern, which is this. Yeah, which I hope I can do. So not only is she playing a very simple finger picking thing, but she's doing that little hammer on, which is a big, big part of the, uh, that ominous kind of thing that's driving through the song. So while she's doing that, I'm doing this. That's all right. That's all right. So, so we've got that interaction of me just playing big open diamonds with a kind of a bum cha sort of a thing going on while she never ever lays off of that, that finger picking pattern through the song. Um, the other thing uh, that I'm doing with my chords is I'm actually playing very dissonant chords. So she's playing straight A minor, straight E minor, and that kind of thing. And I'm doing this. So there's a whole lot of notes in there I'm playing that she's not those particular chords I can only play really to get that type of sound where I am on the guitar neck yeah. because of the way that it's open with all those open strings ringing. So now we're going to put the vocal on top of it just so you can hear the interaction of the rhythm of the vocal uh, and the melody against what we're doing with the guitars. We're going to start with the intro of the song because uh, we do something a little bit different. Uh, I don't play at all in a lot of it. Uh, but I also use a little bit of harmonics in the beginning of the song, which I hadn't mentioned before. Okay. Uh, but it starts totally with just Nancy's guitar. There's a gas light in the corner Throwing shadows on the wall I can hear your laughter echo And it follows me down the hall Faster I try to run from you, the closer you seem to get. You've been gone for at least ten years now. Just wish your memory'd leave my head. But the ghosts they like to rummage through the attic of my mind, and their footprints kick up dust of the impressions you left behind. I usually play those harmonics a little better, but uh, that's the idea. And not until the second verse do I come in with that that's okay. going over top. So yeah. the, the other idea here that we're illustrating is to allow your arrangement to grow and have somewhere to go. If you come out of the gate every time with everything full barrel, then you have nowhere to go from there. If you start really, really down, especially in a song like this, you can start stacking different things throughout the arrangement. And I never ever play a verse or, or any part of the song the same way twice. Uh, just little sprinklings of stuff uh, as we go. And Nance holds down that, that rock solid bottom of it the whole way through. So now for something completely different. Uh, we're gonna actually play, uh, Nancy's gonna be open in the key of A, uh, playing a, a little pattern up and down the neck around A. And I'm actually on the second fret playing in G, but I also have my lowest string tuned down a whole step. So it would be, if I was open, it would be tuning the E string down to a D. Um, and so I'm going to have uh, that going on while she's got her thing going on. And this is what we call a drone, uh, where we, we've got a, a constant uh, note or a couple of notes that sort of ring out through the entire song and never really, really change. Uh, this is another one of those very uh, solitary, kind of intimate songs, uh, and it gives the the chance for the vocal to take center stage 
and still keep the music interesting uh, underneath it. So it goes like this. So complete with out-of-tune guitar in my case, uh, that's the drone. So what I'm doing here is I'm playing a G chord uh, with that uh, drop D thing going on there. So that's a pseudo bass line against what Nancy's doing with her descending uh, chord line. So that is an example of a drone. There's a whole lot of other stuff that was going on there. Crap loads of uh, arpeggios, add nine, <laughs> add uh, twos. I think there's a sus or two yeah, you play in there. Sus I play, yeah. uh, all sorts of stuff. So that, that's kind of like a conglomeration of a lot of things we've been talking about. And yet it's not, well. It's very sparse. Yeah, it's still sparse. Uh, yeah. there, there's a lot going on, yet hopefully not anything getting in the way uh, of the lyric and the message of the song. So one more thing we want to mention about this song uh, is the notion of using the triplet uh, and dynamics in general uh, when you go into the bridge. So we're going to go into the bridge here and you'll hear uh, that we use dynamics, but we also use them to emphasize something that's happening in the lyric in particular. So uh, the, the triplet that we, we sing uh, complements what the rhythm or the prosody of the vocal is doing. One, two, three, four. Higher and higher and higher We all watched you rise till you couldn't see ground You never asked to be up on that pedestal Maybe you just wanted down And then we go back to uh, Yeah, and then back into the, the drone basically so there's less drone going on in the bridge to kind of break things up a little bit. Okay, one last song for you. This one has a whole bunch of uh, the stuff we've been talking about before, but uh, plus a, a few new things. Uh, the most important one being Nancy is actually using... Uh, a half capo. A half capo and a full capo. Uh, yeah, I'm using two. So this capo, um, it creates an A chord. It's, it's put pressing down the three strings. I don't know if you can see that or not, but uh, it presses down the three strings to make an A chord. So I'm starting with an A, even if I'm not playing anything. You could also put it um, on the top three um, minus the E string so that it makes an E suspended. Right. Okay. But in this case, I'm using it as an A chord. So not only does that give you that open tuning type yeah, of sound, right. uh, but what else does it do for you? Well, funny, you should ask, Fett. Please tell us, Nance. <laughs> it allows me to, to do a bass note behind the chord. 
so behind the A chord, I can, I can, you'll see. Uh, Try doing that with one capo. Yeah, right. So. Uh, okay, so uh, while we're on that subject, so Nancy is going to play, uh, there's a, uh, like, she's going to play a signature line now within her chord structure. So this is what she does. Notice that little triplet there in the dynamics. Bum, 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 dun, dun, dun. Yeah. So while Nance is doing that, I have to be careful to not get in her way because if I overplay or play too much uh, activity in my part, then that na, 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 na is going to get lost, that signature line. Yeah. Uh, so now Nancy's going to play that, and I'm going to play what primarily what I play through most of the song over top of it. One, two, three, four. Well, folks, we've gone a little bit over time. Oh, no. Click the mic to make it hot. That's not good. Hi guys, we'll get that <laughs> fixed for you. We'll finish this video off. Here, mm. give us a second. I clicked the wrong button. <laughs> we'll fix Apparently. it up. Here, we got a couple minutes. There you go, right there, minute. right there. Uh. For you to go. There, make it live. I guess we're ready, huh? <laughs> hey, everybody. Hi. Oh, I'm Fett. And no. oh, I'm that's Nancy. The that's Nancy Moran <laughs> over there, my partner in crime. Okay, uh, we're back. Sorry, give us one second. We're just having a little bit of issues right here. Yeah, we are. Have a here. chair. Yeah, let me sit down. We accidentally pushed Michael live instead. Of, here, give me one second. I guess we're ready, huh? <laughs> hey, everybody. Hi. I'm Fett, and I'm Nancy. That's Nancy Moran <laughs> over there, my partner in crime. Hello. Okay, I'm sorry that I cut Fett and Nancy off. I feel terrible. Their video is actually two minutes long, and we were trying to pull off a technological miracle so that uh, we could get going on this next thing. So I'm sorry, Fett and Nancy, but. Uh, Buy Fett's book and go to their website, uh, azaleamusic.com, and check them out. That was a great class, you guys. Uh, you didn't move nearly as quickly as Mark Giovanni and still got a ton of information there, so thank you. All right, we'll be right back with you in about a minute, and we're going to go live. Don't miss this Air Gigs video. I have totally fallen in love with this company. I feel like we got a sister company out there, so stick around, watch the video, and afterwards we're going to do a little Q&A with their CEO.